All right. Well, I tell you what, we're in a series. Uh, I guess before I kick off, I want to welcome everybody that's watching online, everybody that's at Campground Fellowship and Lakeside uh, Sandy Beach Church. We're glad you're joining us online today, right? And uh, help me welcome everybody that's watching, and we're glad that you're with us. If you're watching online, that's your opportunity to say hello, type it in the comments, give us a shout, let us know that you're there, tell us the campsite you're at right now or the state you're watching from and be included in the service here. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're in a series that uh, we're getting close to wrapping up called uh, um, Soulmate, and we really look at the myths and uh, the truths of lasting relationship. Falling in love is easy. All you need is a pulse to fall in love, right? Staying in love, that's a whole nother game right there. There's a lot of apps, there's a lot of websites on how to fall in love, but uh, there's, there's not really a lot of resources how to stay in love, but there's only one resource that you need, and that is the Word of God. He is the author of love, and he is love. He's the one that knows all about lasting love, and that's what this series really takes a look at. And so next week, we've got Steve Hage. It's going to be in the house. He's going to be a lot of fun. We'll take a break from it, and then we'll come back and wrap it up. Sound good? All right. Well, buckle in, because uh, I think what we're going to go today um, is kind of a PG-13 uh, message. Um, I want to talk to you today. It, it is really... Uh, Probably one of the most important messages, I believe, in this series. Uh, this is really about how to protect your marriage. Um, as, as we take a look at this one, I, I, you need to understand that everything I'm going to share with you today isn't because I'm a pastor. It's because I'm a man of God. Uh, I love Jesus, in other words, and I love my wife. And so everything I'm going to give you isn't, well, you're a pastor. That, no, no, this is... Everything I'm giving you is from common sense as a Christian. I want you to realize that, that filter because there's some things we're going to cover today that I think is just sheer wisdom that has protected my marriage for 39 years that to some might seem extreme, but it, it is to realize that as a pastor, uh, I don't have a special anointing or a special grace to deal with life. I'm on the same playing field as you. Uh, in fact, one could even put together an argument, maybe my playing field's a, got a little more of a battle because I, I, I stand in the role of the point of the spear at times. But really, to trust God, to follow God, he gave me the same measure of grace and faith that he's given you guys. I'm just here to tell you, 39 years being married to the, this incredible lady in the front row, uh, here are some things that we have done to protect our marriage. Because we see too much the devastation that follows when you don't protect your marriage. This is totally a, 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 a preventive message, and so I really want to encourage you to take notes on this one. Um, there's a couple of verses I'm going to land on, Proverbs 5, 1, 1 Peter 5. We're going to put some others, but I really want to talk to you about something that's rarely talked about. In fact, I'll be honest with you, um, I've never heard it talk about except one other, one other time, uh, but, I, but really talked about in churches, and I really want to talk to you today about how do affairs happen? Because one needs to be intentional to protect their marriage. This is a message that I always like to include in the marriage series whenever we've done it. I've taught this message two other times. Um, every time there's updates and more revelation that, that I put with it. But as we take a look at, at the devastation of when there's a betrayal of trust in a marriage, when there's an affair, how, how does one go about e protecting that from even happening? Because the Bible says that your enemy is like a lion. And he's seeking and roaring, looking to devour. And one of the things he's going to devour, any chance he gets, he will devour a marriage. The marriage represents the image of God. The marriage is a covenant of two becoming one. The marriage is, is the representation of Christ and his love for the church. And, and it's a symbol to the world of, of his love for the church. It, it's, it, it what is the nucleus of the family. If the enemy can destroy the marriage, it destroys, there's a lot of collateral damage. And so I want to just also 
as we talk about how do affairs happen. Uh, I also want to let you know that if this touches you personally, maybe, maybe you, you've had an affair. Uh, it, I was amazed at, in a survey done, they said there was between 25 and 30, between 25 and 30 percent of all Americans admitted that were married, admitted to having an extramarital affair. That's, a, that, 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 that's mind blowing to know that this impacts 25, 30%. I'm not naive to, to realize that as, I, as we talk about this topic and what God's word says, that there's people here that um, may, maybe you're, you are the one that felt a temptation. Maybe you're the one that used poor judgment. Uh, I'm here to tell you that, that God redeems and heals that there's a path of healing and forgiveness and restoration if you fall on that side of the coin. But this is really to be a guard and a word of encouragement to, uh, to everyone here today. You know, when you take a look uh, at just the attack marriages are under, you can't be naive to think that this shouldn't be on your radar. Oh, this would never happen. Um, in fact, every time that we have put together pieces from an affair, you hear the words, it, it, was never, it never should have happened. I never would have dreamed it, it would happen. Um, there was a, there's a website that's specifically designed, there's dating websites and dating apps. There's a website specifically designed to help married people have a secret affair. I, I won't even give the name because I don't want to promote it, but many of you will go, oh, I've heard of that. that. That's what they market themselves as, is we're a discreet dating website for people that are married looking to have an affair. And when the website began in 2008, its first year saw a 192% increase in membership. And for the 12 years immediately following, they grew 71% every year. Worldwide, um, Worldwide, 130 million people around the world visit this website monthly. And so in Proverbs 10:9, it says, The man of integrity walks securely, but he who walks crooked paths will be found out. I think there's two reasons why affairs happen is one, we, we think that we can keep it secret, we can keep it under wraps, we can live a double life. This verse tells us that it'll always come out. A man's crooked past will discover, his sins will discover. I, I think the, the, the reason why it is so tempting is so many people uh, play what I call the Samson game. This is going on 20 years of experience. Uh, so many people play the Samson game, and the Samson game is this. If you've read the story, uh, a, a historical account of Samson, Samson has an anointing from God, and he has a secret because he's in covenant with God to his strength. He, he was a Nazarite, and so he grew out his hair as a sign of covenant with God. His long hair wasn't magical. It was a symbol of covenant. And, the, and, and because he was in covenant with God, the anointing of God rested on him. And so he now starts to have a relationship with somebody outside the faith, which God tells him not to do, but he decides to just follow his lust anyway. And he is under the mindset that he can control and contain sin in his life. I call it the gas and the matchstick theology. There you go. That, that's, a, that's a good commentary you can find somewhere, right? I don't know. The gas and the matchstick theology. Now, I can have a can of gas here, and I can have a match, and, and I'm okay until I strike the match. Now, now the game gets interesting, doesn't it? You got a lit match, and you got a can of gasoline here, but you're still okay, and the game is this, that you play with sin, is how close can I get these two together without them igniting and blowing up? And we begin to think, because I've got the match lit and nothing happened, I'm good. And then we make a progression, and we make a progression, and, and it's good. And we begin to think, I can contain this and still walk with God, still have the blessings and the favor of God. And sometimes we mistake in the favor and the blessings still in our life is God's acceptance to the game that we're playing. However, in this uh, um, analogy, there, there's, how many of you realize gasoline has vapors that the vapors ignite before the liquid ignites. That logically, we think this should be safe, but when the vapor reaches the spark, it's not a slow burn, but it's an explosion. And this is what this verse is saying, that a man's crooked pass, eventually, you can light the match, you can hold the gasoline, and you can be safe for a period of time, but eventually, those two are going to blow up on your life. And so, part of it is just a 
lack of fear of God's word being true. I had one of a pastor friend that was praying, a lady came up for prayer after service and she said, would you pray for me? I'm in this relationship and, it, and it's not going well. And uh, she goes, uh, she began talking and all of a sudden the pastor goes, now, are you guys living together? She goes, well, yeah, we've been living together for a couple of years and it's not going well. And uh, so he pulls out the Bible and he begins to show her verses about staying pure and not being sexually active and, and avoiding the presence of evil. And he says, read these verses because he's trying to show her, I can pray, all, I can pray for you all you want. It's not going to do any good because you're not obeying the word of God. This was her response. She read it and she goes, I'll pray about that. He's like, you don't pray about the word of God. The word of God is the word of God. You come into alignment with it. And so I think part of it is why do affairs happen is we, we play the match, we play the gasoline, and, and we think we can duo live this life, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow up. Here, here's the other thing that I think leads to why affairs happen. The second mistake is, um, or here's the other mistake, is people underestimate the devastation. Sin always Promises more and under delivers. Can I get a like it on that one? I'm going to try to lighten this up. Are you guys doing okay? All right. I, I, how do you lighten up such a serious topic? And, and part of it is I, I've dealt for 20 years on the devastation on this side. You know, I, I just want to kick the devil in the teeth on this one. I, 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 I'm going to come at you a little strong. You know I love you, right? You know I love you. Okay. I'm going to come at you a little strong because the spirit of stupid gets on some of us when it comes to this topic. And, and, and so this, this is a, a good, loving encouragement. But people underestimate. In Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's why I'm not going to follow my emotions. I'm not going to follow, uh, but I'm going to trust in what God's word says. In Proverbs 5, uh, 5, 1, we underestimate the devastation. And in Proverbs 5, verse 1, it says, Keep uh, a path far from her. Do not go near the door. It's talking about the spirit. Uh, it's going to refer to it in the female sense, but it's not a literal woman. It, it's the spirit of adultery that's being referred to here. There's a spirit of adultery that can get on a man, it can get on a woman. It's, it's not gender specific. It says, Keep a path far from her. That's the spirit of adultery. Do not go near the door of her house. Do not... Hold the match. Do not hold the gasoline and see how close you can get these two without them blowing up. It says, just stay away. It's like Joseph. You need to flee from that situation. Don't play. Don't negotiate. You need to run away. You need to get a... What's it saying? You can't put your boundaries. You can't set them too far out. Are you hearing that? When it comes to your marriage... You can't be re too ridiculous in some of the boundaries. Now, I'm really trying to show an extreme because I'm trying to wake people up because they, they have no boundaries or they say that's stupid or, or their boundaries are too tight. So I'm, I am trying to use some extreme language here. But understand, it says, do not go near her house, that, that spirit of adultery, lest you lose honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. That just means this. If you get too near her house, all you have to do is get near and you're going to fall prey. That's what this verse is saying. In Proverbs 5.10, it says, Strangers will consume your wealth, and someone else will enjoy the fruit of their labor. You know, Toby Keith has this song that he wrote a while back, says, Who's that man living my life? And he talks about pulling up in the driveway, and there's another man in his house with his wife, with his kids, and he writes the chorus, Who's that man living my life? The Proverbs already talks about this thousands of years ago, that this spirit brings devastation financially. People just underestimate 70% of the net worth is lost after an affair is made public. It's financially devastating. 25% of the time, complete financial ruins comes to the entire family. One of the most public figures, Tiger Woods, ranked in as the number one golfer and held that number one position longer than any other pro golfer at the youngest age in history. The year he had an affair, he was instantly plagued with financial ruin, sponsorships drops, and plagued with injuries. And it was only five years, uh, within five years from the top number one, he fell below the top 100 ranking and no longer uh, was even in the top 500 before he retired. 
It's not just financial, it's all of a sudden the anointing of God's blessing being lifted. It's a spirit, you need to understand, it's a spirit of adultery that comes. It's devastating. And I think the reason they happen is, is, is we don't take serious the word of God and his cautions and we play match in gasoline and, and we underestimate the damage that, that sin and this spirit causes in our lives. And so, how do we head down this crooked path? If you're taking notes, I believe there's 12 steps to an affair, I've called this one. 12 steps to an affair, and I think if uh, most of us were honest, pretty much all of us have been to step three at some point. Everybody's going, well, not me. (laughs) (laughs) I I wanna give you these 12 steps so that you can honor God's wisdom and not go near the adulterous spirit. Here's step one to 12 steps to an affair. It says something happens that make you lean away from your spouse. Because as Eileen and I were talking, we're either leaning into the marriage or you're leaning out from the marriage. That, that falling in love is chemistry, staying in love is relationships, and healthy relationships take work. Can I get an amen? And that, that's a myth that if we were really in love, this shouldn't take work. Nobody loves me more than Jesus. I'd like to say that I love nobody more than Jesus. That relationship takes effort on my part to draw close because there's a natural tendency to drift away. There's a current that pulls me away, so I have to be leaned in. If I'm neutral, I'm drifting. I have to lean in to draw into him. Draw near to me, and he says, and I will draw near to you. That's what scripture says. Healthy relationships take a leaning in because there's a natural drift. In the marriage, it's just like our relationship with Christ. If I do nothing, I've drifted. Your physical body, if you don't work out, it deteriorates. It's a natural sign of deterioration. You have to put effort to strengthen. Does this make sense? Okay, so the step one, 12 steps to an affair, something happens that you begin to lean out. It doesn't need to be anything big. It, it, it can be a question about a purchase. It can be an issue with the kids. It can be an issue of you didn't call me and you were supposed to be here an hour ago. There is just this frustration that all of a sudden you lean out from the relationship. That's step one of the 12 steps to an affair. And there's an awareness that you always have to lean in. I like what Joyce Meyer says, if you're in an argument and you wanna be the person in the right, then you need to do the right thing. And I love that because there's a lot of times where I can become justified in my own mind, well, this one's not my fault, this one's on her. And there's this, there's this, there's this, until she says I'm sorry, until she does this. And, and then all of a sudden you realize, look, if I wanna be in the right, then I gotta do the right thing. I gotta lay down my life and I've gotta lean in to restore Regardless of the situation, I gotta seek to restore. If It only takes one of you to have that mindset, but if you both have that mindset, you have a great relationship. You gotta swallow some pride. You gotta say and have conversations that you know aren't initially gonna go well, but are necessary to reconcile. You're either leaning in or you're leaning out from the relationship. And it says uh, in Ephesians 4.26, this new command I give you, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Um, or I'm sorry, that, and then in John 13, it says a new command I give you, to love one another. Make the choice to love and to stay in love. Uh, I always kiss Eileen every day. My dad and my mom, who have gone through just incredible challenges in their marriage, always taught me, even if you're angry, if you leave, you kiss her goodbye, because it could be the last time you see her. You never know, they said you never know, there could be an accident. So we always kiss each other goodbye. And there's been times where we've had a discussion and I said, I need to cool off. (laughs) (laughs) Has it there? Why? Because love is a choice. And I wanna step out and if there is an accident, the kiss is the last thing we're gonna have. There's 12 steps and I'm on step one, we're gonna go. 
there's an awareness of another person that's step two. Like I said, I, th I think everybody, if we're honest, you've been to three, we've been to three steps. There's an awareness of another person. You linger in your thoughts. I wonder what it would be like if I had married that person. It's just a thought, it's just a thought. I wonder what it would be like. They, they seem so happy, they seem so this, they seem, they seem to be that thing that I wish I had. And, and you just have a thought. First Peter 5, 8 says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to, whom it can devour. Resist him standing firm in your faith. I can't entertain that thought, even if it seems like an innocent. I'm not talking a sexual thought. It's a thought of what would it be like? There's, a, there's something there. And it says to take that thought captive. This one says to resist that thought, to put light on it. In Genesis 4, 7, I love what the Spirit of the Lord says to, um, uh, to Cain. He says, if you do what is right, you will be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you and you must master it. Here's what I'm saying. There's an enemy constantly waiting for you to leave the door cracked open. You're either leaning in or you're leaning out. Second two is you just have this, you, you see this thought, you have this thought, what would life be like? Number three, innocent meeting, uh, innocent meeting open for flirting. They're not planned. You didn't plan to meet. You're just, you're just running to each other at the coffee shop. You just run into each other in a hallway at work or even at church. On a, on, on a survey of where do affairs begin, uh, number one was the workplace, number seven was church. And, and so you just kind of ran in and, and, and there was nothing planned, but while you're there talking, there's this innocent flirting. Here's, here's what I'm talking about, innocent flirting. Uh, ladies, she laughs at his jokes. Guys, uh, he compliments her on her outfit or her new haircut that you didn't notice. It, it, it's on an innocent level. There's nothing even sexual at this point, but there's something that while we were just talking, you reacted to a way that affirmed something in me and I liked it. And I think I'm hooked to where I wanna experience it one more time. Is this making sense? Step four. The meets become intentional and planned by one of the people. There might be somebody that's totally innocent in this. You might be going, oh, I have zero interest. I'm not, but they, it only takes one. And now these meetings are gonna be a little, they're gonna, they're gonna become intentional. And it looks like this. I know on Wednesday at nine o'clock, this person's at Starbucks. So I'm gonna put myself there. The other person might be totally oblivious to this, but now you begin to observe where they're at, their routine, and you're making sure now the meetings begin to become more intentional in there. This is where I said the spirit of stupid can get on us. Here's another boundary we, we have. Man, I'm just telling you straight up. Now this is an issue both sides, so I don't wanna sound like I'm, I'm picking on men. I'm just gonna say this should be a rule for the marriage, but I'm an outgoing personality. Surprise, right? I, I'm just that guy that I go into a restaurant a couple times, everybody in the restaurant's gonna know me, then my waiter's gonna know me. I, I'm just, I'm that kind of guy. I'm a person kind of guy. Um, my wife has a radar that NORAD only wishes they could tap into. <laughs> because in 35 years, of our marriage, 20 years of ministry, there's been a couple of times where Eileen says, do not go near that woman. I said, what? She has a thing for you, or she likes you, or she's interested, she's doing, she's, there's something. You, you're never to have that, that as a waitress again. You're never, uh, just stay away from that person. 
And I'm like, you're crazy. And I begin to, uh, initially, we would argue about it because there would be zero in, in my heart, in my flesh, and she's just going, I'm telling you, there's a hook there, stay away. There was one time we were having this exchange and I'm saying, honey, I am just telling you, uh, you're, you're overreacting, you're being too sensitive. And she was so adamant about it, she actually called Pastor Bobby my apostolic. And she said, you come down here, and I got called into my own office. <laughs> Dude, I know why you guys freak out now when you get called to my office. And everybody's like, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm like, you're not in trouble. I love you. Oh, and I got called into my own office. I go, I'm in trouble. They ain't no fun. And I told this, that will never happen again. Because when the lady says, no, I, it, it doesn't matter if I need to agree with it, if I even see it. Uh, she says, I'm uncomfortable with it. That's all it takes. This needs to be a two-way street. If you just go, you know, I'm just uncomfortable with that. That's all it should take. Um, we, we put these boundaries, not because we're pastors, we put these boundaries to protect us because there's an enemy crouching. And if I don't master this, if, it don't, if you don't master it, it's gonna have its way with you. So here, here's the thing I'm gonna just say. We've been married 34 years. I do not have one female friend in my life. Eileen has a bunch of friends that I know. We have couples that we are friends with. I have zero, am I telling the truth? She goes darn straight. Uh, <laughs> Eileen does not have one male friend in her life. I have some male friends that she knows. I, I do not talk about my feelings with the opposite sex. I do not meet with the opposite sex. I'm in a, I'm in a vocation, a job where, where you minister, and there will always be somebody present if I have to minister to the opposite sex. When I was at Granger and I was uh, a sales rep, there was female purchasing agents, and you take people out to lunch, I would always get an assistant from uh, the, the office, and I'd say, why don't you meet us for lunch? I want to bless you for all the work you do for me as my assistant in the office, and we're going to take this purchasing agent out. In the corporate world, I was not going out to lunch with the opposite sex alone. Yeah. Here's what I'm saying. You got to get stupid on this thing. The world will go, that is stupid. You, you know what? Call me stupid. I'm happy. It's devastating to see what this causes, and it's preventable. Pride is what gets in here. And I'm humble enough to know I can be stupid. You gotta be, you, you gotta go on offense on this, folks. I'm just telling you, this thing is real. This thing is real. And, and nobody ever wakes up, nobody ever wakes up and says, today's the day I'm gonna just ruin it all. I think today, what do you want to do today? Well, you know what? I think I'm just going to ruin it all. I think I'm just going to ruin myself financially. I think I'm just going to devastate the people that I love. I think today's the day. I got nothing planned. I think today's the day where I just mess it all up. This thing is a progression. This is a 12 steps, and it starts in the shallow end, and it starts leading into the deep end. And the, each step you take, the harder it is to swim. That was number four, right? Number five, in a group setting, the two of you begin to linger in conversation. You begin to take the conversation a little deeper. 30% of all affairs begin on social media, by the way. Here's the other policy that I have is, uh, I recommend either you have a joint account. In our case, Eileen has all the passwords to all my social media, to my phone, to my emails. She has all my passwords. If your spouse does not give you access, there should be red flags going up because if there's nothing to hide, there's nothing to hide. But I want light so temptation doesn't come into my life. And so we, we, we have social media that's open. I'm actually transferring my Facebook account to what they call, I think it's called a fan page because I don't like Messenger. Right now, Messenger's an email, and, and so we're changing my Facebook so that there's gonna be no Messenger. It's like, you know, if you need me, I love you. If you need me, I'm right out there in the lobby, right after church, or you can call the office, uh, but, but at midnight, 
I don't want to receive any emails or uh, messages through social media. I want to close these doors so that I can master these things. And, and you know what? You do too. We all do. So 30% start on social media. Eileen has access to everything. Number six, huge danger point. You begin to talk about your feelings with one another. Just look at where have I gone on this? And you begin to talk about your feelings with the opposite sex. I never talk about my challenges, my frustrations, my hurts, even my victories with the opposite sex. Never, never. When do I do this? Never, never. But they understand, they're a good friend. Never. Sharing romantic feelings, uh, emotions and feelings uh, is romantic to a woman. Sometimes we even start to put it in, in spiritual context, and that is, I've heard these things. Uh, you've been talking about God even, and that you'll, I've heard couples say this, let me tell you about the deep workings of God in my life. I just want to share my faith with you. I, I, I just, you know what? I've been in a dry season, and God has just sent this relationship or us because you're a breath of fresh air, and we begin to cloud it in spiritual religiousness. That is step number six. You begin to talk about intimate feelings. Again, we're not, we haven't even gone sexual yet. It goes fast, and as you share your feelings, your frustrations, your challenges in your marriage with the opposite sex, it just leads to that path of number six. The, here's the, where I'm going to come into the home stretch. Seven through 12 can happen in hours. Steps one through six can take weeks, months, even years. Step six is when you need to start screaming for help because steps seven through 12 can happen all in one day. The gas fumes reach the spark. The two people have scheduled meetings under the guise for something else. This is where you lie to your friends to justify meeting. When confronted, you either come clean or you lie and double down. I need to meet to go over some business. We need to meet because of this project. We need to meet because of uh, you know, our kids are in sports together, uh, but you have guys and you lie about it. Number eight, the two people know, uh, the, people, the two people now have isolated meetings for pleasure. And you start talking about romantic stuff. You know, I haven't felt like this in years. God has brought you into my life because there's been a dry season of encouragement. I believe God has placed you in my life. And now we begin the conversations romantically. Number nine is there's embrace. Sometimes it can be playful touching, but there's an embrace. Number 10, embrace has become passionate. And number 11, adultery happens and torment begins. And then the 12th step, I should be, there should be 11 steps because 12 is it becomes public. Let the pass of a crooked pass of a man become known. There was a study in the University of Alabama that finds relationships formed out of adultery are three and a half times more likely to fail. I love the conclusion of this study from Alabama. The moral of the story is that if you're looking for functional, healthy, and happy relationships, it's not going to be born out of infidelity. <laughs> Hello. And so... Here's what I want you to catch today. Blessings begin in your own home. In Proverbs 5.16, it says, Should your springs overflow in the streets, should your streams of water in public squares, let them be yours alone. You understand these are sexual an analogies we're talking about, right? Okay, so... I say this because the Bible's really kind of good, man. Why do, you, why do you need to watch some of the stuff on TV? Right, here's some racy stuff, but it's all good. <laughs> Should your springs overflow in the streets or in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in your wife of your youth, a loving doe, graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. You didn't know that was in the Bible, did you? Bible memorization time. 
May you ever be captivated with her love. Sorry, stepped out of bounds on that one. <laughs> May you ever be captivated by her love. Question is, what is captivating you today? You know, man, your wife is a mystery. I've been married to Eileen for 35 years and she is a mystery. The way she was wired 10 years ago, she's not wired that, that way anymore. She's a mystery. Sorry, ladies, we're, we're no mystery. We, eighth grade, we quit developing. That's pretty much. <laughs> Physically, we've changed. Emotionally, Eileen says, am I married to an eighth grader? Yep, pretty much, y'all. <laughs> Not much there, but I'm telling you guys, there's a lot to be captivated in a woman and your wife. They are a mystery. And so to protect your marriage, you wanna be, you wanna invest, you wanna be intentional. You wanna be intimate, regularly. You don't wanna allow, when, when you start having kids, it, it, it gets hard to be intimate, but you wanna schedule and not allow too much time to go by. Um, we had some good questions this week, and one was about the bedroom. And, you know, the bedroom's a, a, a sanctuary. It's a place where, where you can be intimate, not just physically, but emotionally. It's like, okay, I know at the end of the day, we got the bedroom, we're going to close the door, and we can get caught up on things. And I can hear about your day if there hasn't been a chance. We, limit a we always limited access to our kids uh, as far as them crawling in and sleeping in the middle of the night. It's like, <laughs> no way, Jack, this was my bed. And I put them back in their own bed. This was a sanctuary that, that, that we always had. You invest in a date night. You text and call. Um, I never want Eileen to feel like an inconvenience, and I have a way of being just uh, sometimes frustrated and short. And when I'm frustrated and short, and I kind of want to, I, I can make her feel like an inconvenience. And so I'm always cognitive of that. And I don't ever want her to feel like she's an inconvenience. Um, and I want her to be able to bop into my office, even if I'm in the middle of something. And, and I, I want to I know that she always has access to me. Um, I, we, we text each other love notes. And uh, I love this. She always puts on fresh lipstick before I walk to the door. I, I text her and say, I'm on my way home. And it's just like, hey, if you want to get dinner started, you don't need to worry if I'm going to be 20 minutes or five minutes. So I just hop in the car, I sign out, and then while I'm in the car, I just, AA, that's, I made a shortcut in my texting, AA, and then all of a sudden it pops up on my way home. And I just shoot it out to her. And she always has fresh lipstick when I come through the door. And you might be going, well, I wish my wife would put fresh lipstick on. Listen, it starts with you. I wish he would text me and let me know and be concerned. You know what? It just starts with you. It, it, you got to protect each other. And listen to her concerns. And, and again, if she has an issue with anybody, it doesn't need to be justified. If she, or if I just say, you know what? I feel uncomfortable it, 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 talking. Um, here's what's funny. I've never had to say that. She has her boundaries way out here. She, she's awesome. Uh, but if one has a concern, that's all it takes. Open up all the social media, Facebook. All right, we good? All right. Was this helpful? Tell me just yes. All right. I think this is about as honest as Scripture gets. This is scriptural, and the Bible is very practical. It's theologically deep and intellectually stimulating, and I get that. But I'm just telling you, this is what the Word says. Don't be hearers of the Word. What does it say? You got to do what it says, and it's practical, and it protects you, and you will find the blessings of God. I'm going to pray for you. All right. Father, I just pray for all those that are currently are in an inappropriate spot in a relationship outside their marriage. And I pray, Lord, that you bring the conviction and the grace to put light on it, to bring truth on it before there's any more damage and deception. I pray, Father, that each person here and watching would have the courage to stand ground and to put light on. I pray for marriages that they would be protected and healed. I pray against those that have broken a trust, that their, that trust could be restored, that there would be a repentance and a humility, that there could be healing in any marriage or that trust is broken. I pray, Father, you'd give us wisdom and discernment because, Lord, your love never fails. I pray against guilt and shame and condemnation that there's hope and there's healing in your love. I pray that over everybody listening. 
And now I want to give you an opportunity with your head bowed and your eyes closed. There's only one way to find forgiveness in your life because we all need forgiveness for something. We're all looking for a love that will last and never fail. And that's only one place we'll find it and that's through Jesus Christ. God's not mad at you. God loves you. God wants to have a relationship. God wants to heal. God wants to restore. God wants to be with you. And so there's one question every heart needs to have answered. The question is, this is my heart right with God. And if you're sitting here or watching and you're saying, I think so, I hope so, today you can know for sure. You might be saying, I try to be a good person. I try to do the right thing. Uh, listen, trying harder to be good doesn't make you right with God. But the Bible says in Romans, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And what that verse means is there's got to be a, a defining moment in our lives where we didn't just believe in God or try hard to be good, but we surrender. And we say, Jesus, rescue me. Come into my life. And if you don't have a specific moment in your life that you can refer back to and, and remember a time like that, this is your moment right now. And it's going to last a lifetime. So I'm going to pray on the count of three. I'm gonna pray for anybody here that goes, I don't know if my heart's right with God, but today I wanna to know, just include me in that prayer. And I'm gonna have you just raise your hand on the count of three. That's how you call out his name is, I'm just gonna have you raise your hand and say, include me in that prayer. I don't know if my heart's right with God. And if you're watching online to click that button or to text and be included. But if that describes you on the count of three, I don't know if my heart's right with God. Include me in that prayer on the count of three, just raise your hand. One, two, right now, three, lift it up. Pray for me, I don't know if my heart's right with God. I don't want to mess this up too. Awesome. 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 Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. It said, you'll be saved. What a beautiful promise that is. And that's what we're going to do now. So if you raised your hand, if you meant to, or you responded, I want you to pray this prayer out loud, even if you're watching online. And church, pray along for encouragement. And just pray, oh, heavenly father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe you died on the cross that you rose again and you're seated on the throne. Jesus, forgive me for all that I've done wrong and I choose to forgive all others. Come into my life today and forever. I am yours in Jesus' name, amen.